Without the talk of protein prediction, it's hard, easy to forget that the reason why proteins get those structures is all related to the biochemistry, and especially the biochemistry of the peptide bonds that the amino acids that the protein letters are connected by, as well as the unique parts of the protein letters, the like side chains or R groups that like stick off of them like charm bracelets and have these different properties. And so it's at the heart of protein folding is the properties of these amino acids and how they're linked together. Um, so different proteins have different um, sequences and different orders of these unique amino acids, so these protein letters, and they're kind of like charms on a charm bracelet. Um, so they like stick off and they influence how the protein folds because the protein wants to fold up so that all of the side chains are happy. So like the positive ones want to be next to negative ones, ones that don't like, or that water excludes, they want to be away from the water. Like in the hot, so those are like the hydrophobic ones. They like hang out in the center and then the hydrophilic. So the ones that are like water's chill with, those hang out on the outside. Um, and this influences how the protein folds. Um, and so, yeah, my uh, peptide is kind of like falling apart that I made, but um, this was, yeah, I bored my mom to tears probably making her make a peace peptide with me. But anyway, um, so today I just um, want to go over why, why proteins fold the way they do. Um, so yesterday we talked about how software can help predict how they'll fold, um, but at the heart of what they're predicting, is the molecules themselves um, and so let's talk about that biochemistry. Proteins are made up of long chains of amino acids which are like protein letters and they have these um, so at the heart of these protein letters is this C alpha this central carbon and it's attached to four different things so it has this hydrogen which we don't really worry about too much it doesn't do much um, in <laughs> things that we're interested in at least but um, then we have this amino group, um, so a nitrogen um, with hydrogens, and then we have a carboxyl group, um, which is the C double bonded to an O and then bonded to an OH, um, so, which can also be a carboxylate group at higher pH, so and the amino group can also um, like gain a proton, so you'll see these with different charge states, so we'll talk more about um, like this sort of charge thing later, but it depends on the pH, which is a measure of how many protons are around. So at a lower pH, more acidic conditions, you'll have a lot of protons around and this nitrogen can like take one up and so then it'll get um, a charge. And then at a higher pH, when there's less protons around than the um, carboxyl um, group can then release that um, to b form carboxylate. So you'll see these with like different charge states. And when one is positive and one is negative, you have a neutral overall and it's called this winter iron, which is a really cool word. But anyway, so this amino group and this carboxyl group, they're going to allow these amino acids to link it together. And then, but the unique part of the amino acid hangs off of this side chain and it's this R group. Um, so we call it like a side chain or an R group. And it's one of 20 um, different unique amino acids, and they all have these different properties that I'll tell you about in a minute. But they have like different size, charge, that sort of thing. And so they're going to influence how the protein wants to fold. Um, but basically, these proteins, uh, these amino acids, are linked together in an order that's specified by the mRNA. So the mRNA is like the protein recipe copy that's made from their DNA instructions. And so basically you have in this mRNA, like each three, you have three letter words called codons. And so each codon corresponds to an anticodon, so which is like the complementary sequence that's sticking off from a molecule called t a tRNA. Um, and so a tRNA is also RNA, but it's like a different kind of RNA. It's like a functional RNA. So it works as it is, and it's not just like a messenger RNA, like a mRNA. The M stands for messenger because it's serving as like a messenger to deliver the protein-making instructions from the gene um, to the protein-making machinery, the ribosome. And so the tRNA is going to serve as like the intermediary. So it has this anticodon that complements the codon and then it has sticking off of it, it has the amino acid that corresponds to um, that codon. And so it's going to bring it to the ribosome, which is this um, protein RNA complex, and then it's going to get transferred to this growing chain and this process of translation. Um, and so this is how you get the order. 
And then because these amino acids have different properties, the, um, the protein is going to fold up to try to satisfy the properties. It's kind of like if you had like a wedding and you were trying to seat everyone at the tables with people they like and like keep them away from people they don't like and that are going to like cause problems. But the thing is like the proteins are um, like the amino acids are arriving in the specified order. So it's kind of like if all your guests are arriving in like they're not arriving at the same time and you can't see one person at a table and then like another person at a table like all the way across the room. Um, so you have to get kind of creative in how you're folding up and how you're seating people. Um, so proteins sometimes even have like chaperones that are like other proteins that kind of like guard the part that's coming out first um, until um, they're like binding like the part that they're going to be next to and the protein comes through and stuff. So protein folding is this like complicated um, process, which is why um, predicting it's not probably not as simple as um, you might think. But basically, when the amino acids link together, that R group is still going to stick out. And so then you, the protein has, is, um, but the protein is restricted in like how it can contort itself in order to uh, get those amino acids that like each other, near each other, and don't like each other, away from each other, and all that stuff. It's all constricted by this, um, the bonds that they're connected to. So these peptide bonds, um, which have this unique property. So those bonds are something called resonance stable, which I'll get to in a second. But basically, they're like atoms joined together. So atoms like in these individual carbons, nitrogens, hydrogens, oxygens, whatever. They bond to, they get joined together by sharing electrons. Um, which are these subatomic particles. And when you have this peptide bond, you have kind of like a, a sharing of electrons among like this nitrogen and this carbon, carbon and this oxygen. So they're all kind of like sharing these electrons. And in order to, sh they, they really like to share because it kind of takes some of the burden off of them. And so it's all happy and stuff. Um, so it's this happy electronal, um, like commune thing, but in order to do that, they have to stay in the same plane. So you can't have rotation like between that C and that N. So you can only have rotation on either side of it. And so that restricts the motion of the backbone to certain angles, as we'll see. But fall, um, so, but so you have all these amino acids get linked together. And once they get linked together, to, in this peptide bond, which is this, like, it's a amide bond. Um, you might see it called that in like other things, just to know that term. Um, so an amide, it's an amide bond, but in the context of like a peptide, we call it a peptide bond, but it's like this nitrogen next to a C double bond to, to an O. Um, but so in a protein, you have this long chain of them hooked up. And so it's hooking up by combining one of the amino groups and one of the carboxyl groups. Um, and so when you do that, you no longer have amino acids. You have, um, because each of these isn't, well, you kind of have like one long amino acid because you have like at the one end, you have the N terminus, which has the amino group. And then at the other end, you have the carboxyl group, so the C terminus. Um, so we say like the N to C and they're actually like the, um, the ribosome puts them together in that order from N to C. Um, and so when you put them together, now each of these, what was an amino acid, we now call these residues. So we'll refer to these as, so this would be like the first residue, the second residue, the third residue, fourth residue, because so, they're, resi they're like the residuals left over from when you join together the amino acids. So a lot of times we'll use the terms amino acid and residue interchangeably, but technically the residue is once they're joined and then like the amino acid is before they're joined. Um, but yeah, so that term can be kind of confusing, um, but that's what it means. Okay, so now you get this chain of amino acids. So that's what we call the primary structure. So that's like the, this primary structure is the order of amino acids. Then that order of amino acids is going to dictate how it folds. And so it's going to fold though, you can still have multiple layers. So originally you have, you have um, like secondary structure. Um, let me get to that. Okay. So you have the primary sequence, which is the order of amino acids. The secondary structure comes from backbone-backbone interactions. Um, 
So because you have those, the peptide backbone, it has these um, like carboxyl group, carb, um, these um, carbonyl groups. So this like carbon bonded to an oxygen that can act as like an acceptor for a hydrogen bond. Um, and then these nitrogens have this hydrogen that can allow for a hydrogen bond. And a hydrogen bond is just like a fairly strong form of like a non-covalent interaction. So they're not just sharing electrons. It's just like these partial charge based um, interactions. But you can get the, because you have the peptide bond, it has like these spaced out. So you have these like oxygen and nitrogen, and whatever. And like they're like all proteins have this sort of, like they have the the same, like this backbone has the same structure where you have the alternating oxygen and nitrogen, alternating donors and acceptors. So proteins can form these like common folds. So these like secondary structures where the backbone's interacting. And so you can get like beta strands. Um, so these individual like arrow things, these are beta strands. And then sometimes you'll get beta sheets where the strands actually, like you have strands next to each other and you get these like beta pleated sheets. So you can't really tell in this ribbon diagram, but these are actually kind of like zigzaggy. So kind of like a paper accordion. I um, mean, these can be parallel or anti-parallel. So these um, ones here are like anti-parallel because the arrows are facing different directions, but you can also have like um, parallel ones, but that has to like loop around or whatever. But yeah, so the arrows are just like showing you that like and to C direction. But you can also have alpha helices, um, which is another backbone mediated interaction that forms these like helices things that we show as these like spiral shapes. So like, yeah, so we've been talking a little about structures in the recent days. So like when you see a cartoon model or whatever like this, it's like a simplified representation of um, more complex looking things um, like these, which are actually simplifications of the actual atomic structure. Um, but these things are really tiny and so it's easier to see like the backbone and all of that stuff when you represent them in like these cartoon type forms. But anyway, so that was the secondary structure. So that involves backbone backbone interactions. Now you finally get to tertiary structure. So now you finally involve all those R groups that I was telling you about were so important for determining how a protein folds. So these now these side chains are going to interact with one another or with the backbone um, to form interactions. But that's not to say that the that these R groups don't influence the secondary structure because they absolutely do. So if you have a like if you have a big bulky amino acid, it's not gonna be happy with like being in a inside of like a helix or that sort of thing. Um, so basically we have with the peptide bond, yeah, so a peptide bond, um, so remember we have that amino group and the carboxyl group, they're joining together um, to form this chain of amino acids. And these chains have these special properties um, where they're resonance stabilized. Um, so basically, sorry, okay. So these atoms are made up of these like subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. And so the protons are positively charged, neutrons are neutral, those two hang out together in the central nucleus, and then around them this electron charge where you have all these like negatively charged electrons. And it's these negatively charged electrons that are actually going to, like atoms share pairs of these to form bonds, and they could also share like two pairs to form a double bond. And so you'll see double bonds like with the O and stuff. But when you see these representations where you have like a one is a double bond and one is a single bond, in the case of like peptide bonds, these are actually resonance stabilized. So we can actually draw like the double bond like either way. So we can draw the double bond going to the O or going to the N. Um, and so what you basically have, you can see that you can have this, if you have it on the end, then you have like this charge. And so we basically, you have this resonance sharing. So these electrons are shared between the nitrogen, the carbon, and the oxygen. And this also means that because they're sharing this negatively charged electron, they're also sharing this partial charge. And so a bit more accurate representation of this peptide bond is to actually show it with like one line and then like a dashed line. And then each of these has like a partial charge. Um, and so this is like resonance stabilization. Um, and so that's going to restrict the motion that the peptide bonds can take. Um, 
So you can't have, as we were talking about, you can't have rotation around this central plane. So you get like this chain of planes um, where you can only have rotation at these like psi and phi angles, which are like between the next to those, but not actually in them. Um, so yeah, so you, then you get this chain of planes. And so we have these psi angle, which is like this nitrogen and this carbon. And then we have this phi angle, which is this carbon and this carbon. Um, and so those take tend to take on like specified um, specified angles in various structures. So like right-handed alpha helices, left-handed alpha helices, beta strands. This is showing you psi versus phi, and you can see there's these like this is like a heat map of where these usually hang out. Um, and you can see these are like hot zones where these um, when you're the ones in the structure typically found. But you also have like places where you don't expect certain amino acids to be. So like glycine, it can be, it's a sci-fi chart, looks a lot more spread out. It has a lot more, it can be in a lot more places because it's really small and flexible. But with proline, you have, it's really restricted because it has that loop around to the backbone, um, which makes it really awkward um, and bulky. And so it's not going to want to form like helices and stuff. And so we talked before about how this is actually a strategy, how the like, mRNA vaccines and the structures, um, like a lot of the biochemical work that's done studying the coronavirus spike protein, it has these proline substitutions to stabilize the region of the protein so it's more stable um, and it doesn't just like fall apart before it can like get you to induce an immune response or before the scientists can study them. Oh yeah, so here's uh, a better picture with these like beta strands and alpha helices. But so these are form these are from backbone backbone interactions, but these are just like a way for them to help arrange the the R groups in a way that they want that the R groups want to be. So it's kind of like a way that you're helping seat the people at your party, but it's not changing who the party wants to be. Like you have to, you're still trying to meet their needs, but this is kind of common ways that, like common table structures kind of, if you want to go back to that analogy, which is probably getting a little, um, not very helpful anymore. Um, but okay, so, but that's your tertiary structure. And then some proteins have quaternary structure where you have other polypeptides join in. So a polypeptide, so that's like a long protein chain. And so some proteins are like a single polypeptide. So like a single chain folded up and they just have tertiary structure. Then some proteins have quaternary structure where they actually like, you'll have multiple chains hanging out together. So this can be, um, when we have something like that, we have a multimer. So a monomer would be a single chain. So no quaternary structure. When you have an oligomer is or multimer, um, so you have multiple things. So you can have like a dimer, which would be two, trimer with three, tetramer with four. Um, and so then um, you can also classify them by whether these chains are the same or different. So you can have like a homodimer where you have the same chain, homotrimer would be three of the same chain. Um, but if you have a hetero, that'd be like they're different. Um, so there's different ways that we can talk about protein structure and different levels of protein structure. Um, but ultimately, all of that structure is coming down in large part to those amino acids. But what's also special are these unique R groups, so these unique parts that stick off. So these parts have different properties. Um, so as um, basically, so some of them, the easiest properties to like, explain or to in, intuit intuit or whatever is like sometimes these ones are negative and sometimes these ones are positive and I say sometimes because it depends on the pH so pH is the measure of protons so like H plus and so these ones can like depending on how many protons so if there's a bunch of protons around we call something acidic and if there's not a bunch we call it um like basic and so the more acidic the more proteins protons there are and the more likely that molecules are to take them up and so these ones so lysine arginine histidine they can take up protons in acidic solutions um and then become positively charged so histidine is kind of like iffy like it's around um body pH so it can be like both ways but lysine and arginine are basically always positively charged then on the opposite end you have 
um, aspartate and glutamate, which are sometimes negatively charged. So if at like a higher pH, um, they're more likely to be negatively charged because there aren't that many protons around. So you can think of them kind of like wanting to donate, which isn't like exactly how it works biochemically, but it's an easier way to think about it. So if there's a lot around, you're going to take them. Um, but, and you don't feel bad about being greedy, but if there's not a lot, then you want to donate. Um, but of course it depends. So that, what that whether and when it happens is determined by something called the PKA. Um, just something to be aware of, and I have um, posts on. Anyway, so there's only these five that are like actually have these like charged things, um, and then you have some that are like nonpolar or uncharged and polar and uncharged. Polar is basically when you have a molecule that has like it's neutral overall but it has like parts of it are charged so it's kind of like if your right hand were charged and your left hand were not charged and so overall you're not charged or sorry your right hand was negatively charged your left hand was positively charged so overall you'd be like non-charged it's kind of like that the idea of polarity so it's like do you have a separation of partial charges but overall you're neutral um and so because you have those partial charges though you can interact because you have that whole like opposite charges attract like charges repel thing um so you have these not these um the polar ones so like these ones down here they can do those like polar interactions whereas the non-polar ones um they're restricted to like weaker hydrophobic interactions which i'll talk more about um, later, but you can think of like these nonpolar uncharged ones. These are often the ones that want to like hide out in the center of proteins where they're away from the water because the water really likes to hang out with charged and polar things because water is super polar. Then you also have aromatic. Um, so these have these like aromatic rings. So um, it's basically so atoms connect through sharing electrons. We'll get more into this later, but they share electrons. Um, and in something that's aromatic, they're like resonance stabilized. So the electrons are kind of like shared in this communal way through um, like among the ring. Um, and then you have the weirdos. Um, so the glycine is really like, it just has a hydrogen. It's like the smallest size chain. So it's like really flexible. Um, cysteine has the sulfur and it can form like these cross links. Um, so it like sulfur sulfur bonds to like other parts of the protein it, um then you have proline proline like loops around itself um and hooks back up to that nitrogen um and so it's weird and it's even more restricted than other ones and so you have a few different things that are going to determine how the protein is going to want to fold so that includes like whether they um, want to hang out with water or not so the hydrophobicity um, whether they're charged or not, whether they're polar or not, like how big they are. So we can actually like order them by these things. So like by the size, so you have your biggest would be this tryptophan, your smallest would be the glycine, and you can order them by hydropathy, which is like how much they want to hang with water. Um, so a very hydrophobic is like the water. There's this thing called the hydrophobic effect, where basically water, because it's really polar, it likes to like form these like networks so like the negative parts of water so that um which is the oxygen want to hang out with like the positive parts of water so the hydrogens um and so they want to form these like networks or they'll and they're also happy to hang out with like hydrophilic things so things that like water loving things so things that are polar things that have a charge um because they'll also um fulfill water's like desires for those charge charge interactions or the partial charge interactions but hydrophobic things so those are like the non-polar things they don't have anything like even partial charge to offer other than like temporary induced charges if like something charge comes by and their electron cloud kind of shifts a little so those are going to be excluded by water and so they're going to get the water's kind of like in a cinch around them and that's why those things get hidden in like the center of the proteins um, and or like on the inside of helices and that sort of thing, like facing into the protein um, or the membrane or whatever. Um, and so you have those typically um, in, inside the protein and the very hydrophilic ones. So the ones that have like charge, they have those partial charge, something that water really likes. Um, then those are going to often be more solvent exposed. So like on the surface of proteins. Um, so that's one way that proteins get 
their shape.